Good evening. I, I feel honoured and very humbled uh, to be asked to speak in such a spiritual and inspiring setting and in such distinguished company. I'm sure that silence uh, is more powerful than any words of mine here and certainly nothing I can say will match the impact of the music we've just heard and we'll be hearing later. It's about music that I'll say a few words first. It's unpredictable power. Sometimes an artist uh, reacts to something and feels driven to action, to unilateral action, to do something, something nobody else can, not on behalf of a government, not for an agency. In many ways, in terms of direct and measurable results, that horrible current malaise, measurable, it's likely to be futile, direct cultural action. However, it will be an action which transcends nations and creeds and beliefs. It's for humanity as a whole. And most important, it's what is often remembered as a vibrant and courageous act by humanity long after atrocities of war, the machinations of politicians and diplomats are forgotten or at least locked away in memories trying to forget. One such I came across the other day reading the recent book called The Cellist of Sarajevo by Stephen Galloway. It's a story, the kernel of which is true, but it's built into a novel about an episode in the Balkan Wars, about a cellist from the Sarajevo Symphony Orchestra who witnessed a bomb attack on a bread queue in Sarajevo which killed scores of people. As a result, the cellist sits outside in that same life-threatening spot every day in the sight of snipers from all sides, playing Albinoni's Adagio, no less, to anyone who would listen. An act, you might think, of reckless, repetitious, but enlightened defiance. In so many ways, an act of cultural diplomacy, but one without the normal rules of engagement for anyone who would listen. Amazingly, he survives. Here's one paragraph from the book. Kenan, one of the characters, a family man, has heard of this story. Someone, maybe his, met, maybe his wife, has told him that a cellist was playing every day in the street where the people were killed while lining up for bread. It was a week or so ago the cellist saw the whole thing happen, watched it from his window. When Kenan was told what the cellist was doing, he didn't say anything, but thought it was a bit silly, a bit maudlin. What could the man possibly hope to accomplish by playing music in the street? Wouldn't bring anyone back from the dead, wouldn't feed anybody, wouldn't replace one brick. It was a foolish gesture, he thought a pointless exercise in futility. But this is so often what's needed, a pointless exercise in futility, the unexpected, the unilateral, a gesture of enlightenment inspired by arts and passion and sadness. The arts, in this case music, as a voice for the inexpressible in words. As I say, it's a kind of transnational act of cultural action, not played out by any rules, just played out by one man calling the world to account for its behaviour. Mention of the word enlightenment reminds me I've, I've just spent several days in Edinburgh at the International Festival, where the theme was that of the Enlightenment, particularly but not exclusively as related to Scotland in the 18th century. It was fascinating to revisit those years which now seem so far ahead of their times, a bit like the ancient Greeks and democracy, the age of reason, when science coexisted with humanities, with religion, and with philosophy, maybe more comfortably than they do today, when the prevailing mantra was one of tolerance, of rationality, of thinking for oneself rather than accepting blind the authority of others. Tolerance was seen as a great moral virtue, as demonstrated by the willingness of those in power then to permit people to express their ideas without fear of repression. Does it seem to anyone else that we have, I hope, temporarily, collectively lost our reason, that we desperately need a reinvention of the Enlightenment and its driving principles in order to rid ourselves of the scourge of intolerance, which in an insidious way seems to be eroding what free speech we have left, and some of us in certain countries, remember, have very little. In a strange way, I think we're going backwards. The arts become more timid in expressing views counter to prevailing opinion, in sometimes tackling the big issues of the day, particularly if there's any religious slant. We're becoming so afraid of giving offence 
nobody dares to be intellectually provocative anymore, save perhaps here at uh, Interdependence. We're even somehow afraid to laugh at ourselves in a light-hearted way, to relax and regard our fellow human beings with humour without loss of respect for fear of giving offence. All we seem to be left with is a kind of glum, humourless compliance. It's not that I'm advocating going around insulting everybody, just that our increasing fear of giving offence and supersensitivity is leading us to be fearful of challenge and provocation, and you can feel it in the arts. An enlightened tolerance implies a willingness to face criticism, provocative statements and ideas, sometimes in the form of debate, writing, humour or works of art. A challenge to the aesthetic and the social status quo, not a blind acceptance. How else will we move forward? I hesitate to use a Turkish word, which I've only recently come across, but I have been in recent weeks captivated, like others, by the portrait of Istanbul in the book by Orhan Pamuk, and in particular his exploration of, I think, the deliciously complex and ambiguous term, huzum. The communal emotion, I simplify, the communal emotion of melancholy, but as life-affirming as it is melancholic. I apologise for appropriating and possibly misappropriating the word, but it's sort of what I feel when I think about the subject of intolerance. Mankind has been through so much and we still can't work out how comfortably to tolerate and understand one another, and the best means of doing this, I believe, through cultural exchange and sharing of increasing diversity, is threatened by increasing intolerance to the views of others. And yet, even in Huzum-like melancholia, on account of our failing to learn from history, it's often the inspiration of art that encourages us to believe that we will eventually come to our senses. I've appropriated one word from here. I finish by appropriating another, this time from the Zulu. It's a word colleagues from ISPA will recall from two recent congresses, Ubuntu, where it was brilliantly expounded by the South African actor John Carney. Ubuntu is not really translatable, but it embraces the solidarity between communities. The word contains a sense of togetherness and of cooperation between people, building strength of purpose between them. What you would not, what you would not be done to yourself, you do not do to others. It's probably the spirit of that that carried forward South Africa through the turmoil of the truth and reconciliation process. To me today, the word is a resonant one, both in sound and spirit. It seems to me to carry for us a strong message of interdependence and a mutual and reciprocal way freely to build trust, to share our culture and to develop new ideas transnationally. So let us abolish the melancholia of Huzum, adopt the comradeship of Ubuntu, and suggest to Ben Barber that perhaps the next topic for interdependence should be on how together we define, inspire, and create a new tolerant age of the Enlightenment for the 21st century. Thank you very much.